Thanks for being here, everybody. We were trying to figure out how to get you some music, Mike. Yeah, I don't know what song I want, but that's a question. I answer mean, questions in my life, you know. Like, <laughs> it feels weird using like a, like a boxer's intro song for like, design, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, that's the song. I'll figure that question out. Like, what if there was a song that summarized user experience design? What would it be? I don't know. Oh. It would not be classical fancy music. It would okay, no fancy no. music. Something like do 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 do. do. <gasps> like, <laughs> embrace the silliness in UX design. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does attention sound like? <laughs> yeah, like flight of the bumblebee. Like ooh. yes. Yeah. Okay, it looks like we are holding steady at the participant numbers. So I'm going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Okay, um, welcome to the New Mexico uh, Smart Grid Center webinar series uh, and this specific webinar, which is Making Effective Academic Posters, The Better Poster Approach. Uh, I am Brittany Vandorf, the Public Relations Specialist for New Mexico EPSCOR, which is the established program to stimulate competitive research. In case you don't know, EPSCOR is a nationwide program funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, I'll be your host today, along with Sarah Pache, who is not shown here, but she's doing all the back end coordination, and she is our Education and Outreach Coordinator. A few housekeeping things really quick uh, before we begin. First, as always, this webinar is being recorded and will be archived on our website at newmexicoepscore.org. Um, next, we want to let you know that we will have time at the end for audience questions. Um, at any point, you are welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box and at the bottom of your screen, and Sarah will shoot those to Mike after, after he's done speaking. Oh, not yet. Okay, here you go. All right, and I also wanna let you know about our upcoming webinar next week, which is Entrepreneurship and Innovation Resources in New Mexico. And it's also the official launch of our new certificate training and entrepreneurship program in partnership with the University of New Mexico, uh, Rainforest Innovations and Innovation Academy. This is open to everyone, it's free, and there's more info on our website. Okay, and Finally, almost finally, Mike's presentation has come at a very opportune time for many of the students on the webinar today. Fall is the season for academic conferences, and we want to make sure that you all know about the New Mexico Research Symposium that is happening virtually November 9th through the 13th. This is a free event and open to all. Uh, general registration closes November 4th. And a special note, thanks to Mike's Better Poster movement that's taking the academic world by storm, we've introduced We've introduced a new poster competition category this year called the best better poster. People who register will be able to vote for their post their favorite posters, uh, hear from our two fabulous keynote speakers and find out who has been selected for this year's New Mexico Outstanding Science Teacher Award. More information is on our website and we truly hope to see you there. All right, okay, for real, to the main course. Um, I am slightly obsessed with effective science commu communication and firmly believe that the ability to communicate one's research is as important, if not more so, than the research itself. Uh, about a year ago, I learned about the Better Poster movement and it blew my mind. Uh, our speaker today, Mike Morrison, has been featured by Forbes, NPR, the American Psychological Association, and many other big names for introducing his Better Poster approach, which brings UX design principles into academia to make sharing research easier for everyone involved. Uh, if you haven't already, go to his YouTube channel after the webinar and watch the videos. They are hilarious and informative. So without further ado, I am so jazzed to welcome Mr. Mike Morrison, creator of the Better Posters Movement. Thank you, Mike. Of course, thank you very much for having me. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I'm gonna switch to my screen now. Give me a second here. I'm a lull before anything starts. Here we go. Brady, can you see my screen? Nod to represent everyone. Okay, cool. Okay. 
So thank you guys again for coming. Um, so what we're going to go over today is something called user experience design. And that's what you're going to learn, hopefully, by the end of this. User experience design is a lot easier to learn than graphic design. Um, I can teach it to you, hopefully, the basics over the course of this webinar. And the main point is that like, instead of trying to make things look pretty, your goal is to communicate very efficiently, even if it's ugly. And if you think about it in terms of like every one of you is studying something that is valuable and that can fix some part of the world that you care about. And that piece of insight that you've probably already learned, you probably learned lots of, lots of insights so far, can help everyone else in your field, right? Because you're all studying the same kind of environment or the same context, that kind of thing. So the question is, how do we get that insight out of your brain and transmit it to everybody in your field who could benefit from it to speed up their own research? And how do we get everybody in your field to transmit all their insight to you so you can benefit from it? What's the most efficient path to that? So it's about creating designs that communicate very fast, very efficiently. So as Brittany said, um, I've got video, I've got cartoons on YouTube um, that some of you hope maybe have seen on physical posters. We've got Better Poster Part 1, Better Poster Part 2, and another cartoon on Twitter poster, which is um, focuses on how to communicate research on Twitter. If you want to know any more about any specific kind of medium, like physical posters or Twitter, check out those cartoons. What we're going to be talking about today is what all of these things have in common, which is these UX principles underlying everything that apply to a lot of stuff beyond posters. So you should really hope, hopefully some of this stuff kind of helps you like level up your game in a lot of ways. So because I know webinars are hard and you may space out halfway through this, I'm going to teach you the most important thing first. So if you pay attention for the first five minutes of this, you can learn really more about the science of UX design than even some UX designers know. And then you can space out after that and you will have taken away the most important part. So what I want everybody to do, this is gonna be a really risky exercise, is I want you to get out your phones and I want you to pull up like whatever app you use to distract yourself. Like if you're already bored of me talking and you wanted to like go to Twitter or Instagram or something like that, like pull up that where you can just scroll. And if you don't want to pull up your favorite app for distracting yourself, I'm gonna pull up mine. I'm gonna pull up my live Twitter feed here. This is gonna be risky. I have no idea what's going to show up on this, but as a disclaimer, I'm a psychologist. I study a lot, or I follow a lot of diverse brains to try to understand them. So give me a second here. OK, so here is my real Twitter feed. And what I want you to do is ideally, you'll get more out of this if you pull up your own like Twitter feed or Instagram or Reddit or New York Times if you're fancy. Just pull up something on your phone that you can kind of scroll through and kind of space out and try to distract yourself. And I'm going to narrate your actions kind of like a guided meditation. So as you're scrolling through here, right, you're seeing these posts and you're kind of trying to figure out what to get interested in. And what you're doing right now is you're using the same part of your brain when you scroll through Instagram or Twitter to forage for information the same way you used to forage for food in the wild when you were like a cave person. So you can think of each of these Twitter posts or each of these Instagram scrolls or whatever you're going through as a patch that may contain like knowledge food, right? And you'll notice right away that sometimes you kind of blow past Twitter, you know, Twitter posts or tweets or Instagram posts. And sometimes when you're interested, you kind of slow down on one, right? You're like, oh, what's this, right? And there's a couple of factors that go into like when you go fast and scroll past something or when you slow down, which is called patch switching or like choosing a patch. And one of those factors like that's probably influencing like which ones you're focusing on. And again, just keep scrolling, keep scrolling, keep trying to find something. But one of the factors that's probably influencing what you're focusing on is how easy you can process it. So if you find yourself gravitating towards like images or graphics, things like that, instead of long text, that's called interaction cost. Things, because you're trying to process my voice right now and do this at the same time, you're gonna gravitate towards things that are very low in interaction cost that you can process kind of quickly. So you're just going towards images and short posts. Keep on scrolling. Now, the other factor here is what's interesting to you, right? So you might find that like, even in a scroll full of images, some things are more interesting to you than others. You know, just like, okay, scientist faces, I like those. Um, Cole's not interested, right? And what's cool is that you can change this, right? So if I tell you to look for something happy, right? You're gonna focus on things, you're gonna skip the heavy stuff, skip the graphs, and you're gonna be like, okay, picture of leaves, oh, a dragon, you know, things like that. Things that are easy and happy and funny, you know, little girl, hopefully she's smiling, doesn't have COVID. Um, and then, you know, things like that, right? That make you like have a positive mood. And if I tell you to change your focus and say, okay, now, now find something political, right? Which shouldn't be hard now. Now you're gonna skip the happy faces, right? And you're gonna gravitate towards things, you know, if somebody has a tie on, 
Um, apparently I don't follow enough politics, but you'll gravitate towards things that give you those cues. Here we go, there's a political post, right? Um, and you'll skip the rest. So what you kind of focus on changes based on your goal. And that kind of whiff that you're getting as far as whether each post matches your goal or it doesn't is called information sent. So you're kind of doing a calculation. You want something that's relevant to your goal, that's strong information sent and easy to interact with low interaction cost. So you want something that's sort of more interesting than it is effort and that's what you'll slow down on. And then if it's too much effort or not interesting enough, you'll blow past and you'll patch switch, right? All right, phones down. I'm sure I have lost some of you. Goodbye to those of you who are now on Reddit for the rest of this webinar. Hope you enjoyed that demo. Um, but what you just learned is called, the rest of you who are left, um, what you just learned is called information foraging theory. So this is kind of the bedrock of every website you use, every app you use is built on information foraging theory. And we'll uh, recap the concepts here. So we had interaction cost. Remember, that's like how much effort something is to use. So if you think of like fast food, it's very low interaction cost. And then like following a recipe, going to the grocery store, buying all the groceries, that's really high effort. That's a really high interaction cost, right? And then it can have really profound consequences too. So like watching a two minute video on police reform, that's really low interaction cost, that's easy, right? But like reading a 97 page essay about the science of police reform, that's really high interaction cost. And so it can have these profound consequences for what we pay attention to. And at some point, if you want people to actually pay attention to something, you have to sort of stop trying to force them to read the 97 page thing and just make a two minute version, right? And that, then all of a sudden you'll get the uptake. And a lot of times if you link to the longer one, the two minutes will hook them, right? So it can really affect what people pay attention to in society. The other factor was information sent. So information sent, remember, it's like how interesting something is. And this can be objective too. So if you think of like titles, right? Like you see articles online, you've got three different kinds of types of titles. We've got one here, like investigating the effectiveness of differential mask usage strategies. Sounds like a normal scientific title. Then we've got like the, a little bit stronger information sent, like the clickbait title. You guys know like, like, uh, like clickbait or like a Buzzfeed title. It's so like worried your cloth mask isn't filtering coronavirus. This hat could make it more effective. That's giving you something. Now I know it's about a, a cloth mask, right? It's about coronavirus. Um, that's giving me something, but it's making me click to learn more to get that full information sent, right? And then imagine what the strongest information sent would be. That would be something like this. Put an nylon stocking over your cloth mask to make it more effective at filtering out coronavirus. All three of these headlines link to the same article. It's three ways to say the same thing. But the strongest information sent you can provide is just get directly to the point. And you can do this with images too. Like check out these three images. So the first one, crowd of people, you're like, what is this? Is it, is it about masks? Is it about a crowd? Second one, you're like, oh, okay, this is definitely about masks. And the third one, nylon stocking over a mask. Really, really specific, really straight to the point, really strong information sent. So the more you get to the point, the stronger the information sent usually. And you can think about this. Here's a couple real scientific article titles. And as you guys are doing, as you're searching and um, doing lit reviews, that kind of thing, you've probably come across titles like this. So you have like that pretty good title, right? Like how does yeast affect cancer cells? That's a real scientific article title. And you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's a pretty good title. I know their research question, right? Um, but you're also thinking like it has that clickbaity feel, that medium information sent, where it's like you could really kind of say this as like, you wouldn't believe how yeast affects cancer cells. Like it's the same kind of feel, right? If we wanted a stronger information sent title, those are those titles you come across like this one, um, COVID attack rate increases with city size. Boom, right to the point, right? That, and when you come across those articles, usually when you're, when you're searching around, you get these strong information sent titles and you're like, oh, thank you, whoever wrote this. Like, this, this is exactly what I'm looking for, right? So really, we want to dial that information sent up as much as we can. And you can think about it, whenever you're designing something, think about it in terms of like, you have to make it interesting enough to overcome the interaction cost, to make it worth the effort. And if you've noticed, there's like two ways to do that. You can either make it really easy and then it doesn't matter how interesting it is, or you can make it really interesting and then it can be harder. You just need one to overcome the other, right? So you can make it easy, information sense really strong. And this is like, um, or if the information sense weak and you make it easy, you can look at it. So things like Instagram posts, like, move, like short YouTube videos, that kind of thing. Those are so easy, 
you'll click on one that's like, oh, a cat doing something I've seen it, a cat do before, neat. Because like, it's so easy, it doesn't matter. You'll click it, right? The information sent doesn't matter. And then an example of like, when it's really high interaction cost, but um, the information sent is stronger enough to overcome it, is like if you've ever walked past the poster at a science conference or like found something where it's like a long form article, but the subject is like really just speaking to your soul, then you just go for it, even though it's really high effort that's strong information sent overcoming that low interaction cost. So summary, think about it as a trade-off. You've either got to make it really easy and then it doesn't matter how interesting it is or really interesting and then it doesn't matter how hard it is. So the other variable is um, patch switching that you learned about. Remember when we were scrolling through the Twitter feed and like you scroll past some things, that's called patch switching. And you can kind of think of patch switching in terms of patterns of patch switching. So I'm sure you've all, Watched a lot of Netflix during this time. Um, and you know that mood you get on Netflix where you're like, kind of not feeling anything. You're just sort of like, I don't feel like watching anything. Nothing interests me. Nothing has an information sent, right? So you're going through these like critically acclaimed film row, right? And like, what do you do? What do your eyes do when you go through it? And you're just not feeling anything. You do this, right? You're like, you kind of skim past most one. You, you check in with like one thumbnail, like maybe Trumbo. And then you're like, no, and you just keep going, right? And I call this like the boredom bump. It's like where psychology studies have shown that if you lock people in an empty room, they'll spontaneously engage. Like we're wired to just sort of test our environment. And I think that's what you're seeing in this pattern where like none of this interests you, but you're gonna check in once just in case, right? Now the, the counter to this, like the healthy patch switching is like if you're really interested in the category and like if you're browsing Netflix and you're like, man, I just want something that's like maybe a reality show and I can just, get away and just escape. Oh, look, escapist reality TV. And you've seen that before on Netflix where just like it knows you, right? You're like, this is what I want. What do you do? What do your eyes do, right? You, you pay attention to everything. You're like the big power, you know, big flower fight, big valley, you know, Rust Valley restores. You like really evaluate each one. So I call this like the kid in the candy store curve patch switching pattern where like, you're like, ooh, that's interesting. Ooh, that's interesting. And this is like a healthy patch switching pattern. So if you think of um, applying this to a virtual poster, um, we'll see how this, let's see how our current virtual poster sessions stand up to this. So here is a real virtual scientific poster session and we're gonna apply what you just learned. So first, what are the patches? Well, each of these posters is a patch, right? Well, where's the, uh, where's the information sent coming from? Probably these titles, right? Or these little file names. But these aren't really file names. These are some guy's name, right? Or some girl's name. I guess it's just like the author name. Um, and so that doesn't give you anything about what the study is about. If you're trying to decide on which poster to browse, you have nothing to go on. You can't read the thumbnails. You can't, like the, the, the author name doesn't give you any information about what the study is about. You've just got this choice paralysis with no, nothing to go on again. So this is pretty close to zero information sent. This is providing you nothing to go on, right? And then let's look at the interaction cost now. So we've got zero information sent. What's the interaction cost of a, of a virtual poster session right now? Is it low or high? Basically, super high. So already you have this choice paralysis, this like, what the hell poster do I click on, right? That's interaction cost. That, that paralysis, that mental energy you're dedicating to like deciding which, po which of these foreign, the like, cryptic, like no information sent posters to click on, that counts as cost. When you do click on one, you just probably out of curiosity, you're like, okay, click, wait for the PDF to load. And then you have this wall of text poster that shows up, right? And you, what do you got to do? You've got to process all of this. You got to immediately filter out everything that's going on, which is cost. Then you got to like zoom in, try to like learn something, pan around, then zoom out. And then like kind of feel a little bit overloaded and fatigued and then click the back button, another cost. And then if you interact with another poster, you've got to go through all of this again, right? So this is a huge interaction cost. You're, you're really making this painful to interact with any given poster over and over again, right? So you have a very, almost no information sent and a very high interaction cost. So what you're probably gonna do is you're gonna check out one, one poster, like the boredom bump style, just to like be a good citizen of your field. And you're probably gonna bail on the whole session and get back to work or browsing YouTube or whatever you were doing before you did this, right? It's probably gonna, you're probably gonna not see a lot of posters because it's just too punishing to do it. You're just gonna maybe click out one or two and then bail. But the worst part is, is that in user experience design research, anytime you're browsing a set of patches or interfaces, 
where you have a really high interaction cost. They're really hard to interact with. They take a lot of effort and they don't give off a lot of information sent. And you're under time pressure. Like I, I'm gonna browse posters for five minutes before I get back to work. What happens is all these variables add up to a negative attitude towards that thing. And you know this because like when you're browsing a bunch of websites and you can't find what you're looking for and you're under time pressure, you're just like, screw this website, right? Like that's, that's that negative attitude. And what, that's what we see in surveys of poster session attendees where everybody just feels kind of like meh about posters. And it's kind of determined by these factors. But the good news here is if we fix this, we could actually create poster sessions that you don't just feel meh about that you like look forward to and you love them and you enjoy them just by fixing these things. And we can create an experience kind of like a museum. Museums have like super healthy patch switching patterns where you just sort of pause in front of each exhibit and kind of see a little bit at a time. And if you're really interested, you stay at one longer. And if you're not interested, you move on. So we wanna create poster sessions that encourage patch switching. The usual advice you get for posters is like, you wanna trap people into your poster for two hours and get all the networking you can out of them and squeeze their brain for every all the little learning. But you don't really wanna do that. You want them to learn from your poster and see your colleagues' posters too. Back to that thing about like all of your colleagues in your field have insight that's relevant for that attendee too. You want poster session attendees to be able to keep moving and see and learn, learn from a lot of posters and meet like a lot of people. Um, so we want to design posters to facilitate like circulating through poster sessions instead of trapping people. This is the traditional scientific poster design. It, um, it's, I, could, I don't think I can say enough negative things about it in terms of applying theory to it. The most negative thing I can say about this, I think the most damning thing, and we'll go into the evidence uh, in a little bit, um, but the most damning thing to me about this traditional scientific poster design is that it hasn't changed in 30 years. You probably use this tem a template like this for posters. I use a template like this for posters. Four generations of grad students before us use this template, right? And you know that because sometimes some of you have like hand-me-down templates. Nothing in science should stagnate like this because if you're thinking about how science works, we're discovering new things every year. We're learning new things every year about how to communicate effectively, how to design, how to design effectively. Why didn't it change? Why didn't posters change in 30 years? If we were applying science to them, they would get a little bit better every year as we learn more about communication and design. And we have so many discoveries in the last 30 years, mainly because the internet happened since this poster was designed. So this poster predates the internet by a large degree. So that's where we're at right now in terms of traditional posters. This thing is, it's, there's something else driving its stagnation. And that thing is probably conformity and fear. Nobody really knows what to do. Everybody assumes there's a good reason for it. So they just keep using it. So this barely, in terms of the evidence, there's a lot of evidence against this being effective at all in person. It's probably worse online. And that's because of there's two main research findings you need to know about how people consume information on the internet. So the two main research findings about how people read online is first, they don't. People don't read online. They like skim and they scan, scan and bounce around kind of selfishly, right? Um, which if you think about this again, some people get frustrated here, like, well, people are so lazy. But really, if you think of laziness as efficiency, it's you can love them for it because laziness really is wanting the most benefit for the least effort. That's efficient. That's, that's an evolved kind of strength, right? You're trying to look for only the information you want and filter out everything else. That's how people read online. And if you want to design successfully online, you have to sort of bite the bullet and make things very brief and skimmable. Because if you make it not brief and skimmable, they'll get nothing. The other fact about how people read online is that when people do stop to read something on the internet, they read 20% slower. So another reason why content has to be very brief, you can't overload people because they're skimming around and they're reading slower online. So let's apply this to improving posters. Let's recap our interaction costs here. We'll take a break in a minute here, but so we're gonna recap our interaction costs, what I went through, the hurdles. So you have to choose, when you go to a virtual poster session, you have to choose a, you have to choose a poster to interact with, you have to click on one, you have to like zoom in and zoom in like multiple times until you're just tired. How can we eliminate these hurdles to design a better virtual poster? I think it's probably the best to start with the zooming. Like if you address one problem on your poster, make it so they don't have to zoom because that zooming is a small action, but it's repeated. So it adds up, it like multiplies. And that zooming in on these virtual posters, having to like zoom and zoom and zoom comes from cramming too much, like trying to cram your entire poster paper onto like a one page virtual poster. And usually I think a lot of people feel like, um, well, I've always heard that it's good to keep your resume on one page, right? And you're thinking kind of like that, like keeping things on one page 
is a virtue. When really like it's only a virtue if you kept it on one page by cutting things. If the way you fit everything on one page is by making the font tiny and cramming everything, that's not more readable. It's just more readable to have multiple pages with bigger fonts at that point. So first tip, break your virtual poster into multiple pages. You're on the internet now, you can, most conferences just want a PDF file in any format. So just give them a multi-page PDF file, which lets you put different sections on different pages and helps you keep that content bigger so people don't have to zoom. Now, some of you are thinking, well, if I just put my wall of text poster onto multiple pages, it's gonna feel like a uh, paper, right? Like nobody wants to scroll through this like paper as a poster. Exactly, that's the problem, you know, like nobody wants to like read it as a crammed one page thing either. So really online, you've got to reduce your content burden. This is like for you too. Like you shouldn't have to feel this burden of having to summarize your entire like five part study on this one page. You should shrink your burden a little bit to picking like the, your favorite part of your study. You can make this decision, pick like one or two aspects of your study that you think are the most important or that you really like the most and teach that one thing really deeply versus trying to teach five things very shallowly. So I think it's probably best to aim for about a minute of total content. Like if you were to read your poster out loud, it should take you a minute, right? You can get kind of anxious about this, but you already have something that's this condensed and that's your abstract paragraph. So your abstract paragraph is already kind of pre-condensed, right? So instead of thinking about your paper or your poster as paper minus, start thinking about it as abstract plus. You can start with your abstract paragraph or like one summary of one study that you did and then expand on it. So you're not cramming anymore, you're actually expanding something already pre-condensed. Just point, just put like one point per page. That way people can pace themselves. And then you can illustrate that point with figures and graphs and illustrations. So people are just scrolling through, they're getting one point at a time, they're getting these big, generously sized key figures where they can explore the data with like good like punchlines about it, right? Um, without getting lost in all these walls of text, right? They can just sort of pace themselves. And then you're gonna have to cut stuff. You might have to cut 75% of your stuff out, right? But we're on the internet now. You can just link to the rest. So have a slide at the end that just links people to your paper or links them to, to more details in some way. That can kind of give you sort of a, a spillover. So you can just sort of like, you can communicate really briefly and really efficiently and then link them to more details if they're interested in. So let's see what this looks like. I'm gonna do an example here. Let's see. So here we have a poster from neuroscience. This is an example of that like one minute conversation. Every design you make is like having a conversation with somebody and if you, it should read like that too. Um, so here, I'm going to do this poster in one minute. Um, this was donated by Rick Krauss. So thank you to him abstractly, but here we go. So this poster, you're going to immediately, you're like, okay, mouse, tone, cheese. <laughs> and then he's got some kind of chemical coming out of his brain. So your eyes go there first. And then you're like, acetylcholine release in the BLA shifts earlier as animals learn about actions and cues that lead to reward. And you're like, oh, well, I just learned something with no effort. What else you got? And it keeps teaching. A novice animal releases ACH when they see the reward. Novice, reward, ACH goes up. An expert animal releases ACH when they hear the cue. Expert, tone, beep, ACH goes up. Methods, we recorded ACH in the BLA with fluorescent ACH sensor photo, uh, photometry. Sorry, not my field. You're like, okay. You see the little mouse with his, presumably needle in his brain. Then the key figure. In mice with more training, ACH spikes on the tone or the poke. And then we can have a second graph here to point out that in mice with less training, ACH doesn't spike till the reward. And then a summary, BLA ACH signaling carries important information about salient events and cure reward learning. So this is already really scrollable, right? And then the thank you that links to the rest. And if you imagine what this looks like on a mobile phone, you could shrink this way down so you could do like, zoom it way out, right? Like a phone, you could still read it. If you got to read a traditional poster on your phone, um, it just, it won't work. But you, you'll have to zoom around and pinch around and zoom on your phone. So this is already much more mobile friendly and it, and it reads very efficiently. And when you get to the end of this, you kind of feel like, well, that was a cool learning bite. What else you got? But that's good. That cliffhanger feeling leaves you some mental energy to keep seeing other posters, right? So you want to keep people circulating. So that's an example of a, Quick virtual poster. 
easy. Get back to where we were. Now, what we've done here is like when we export this, right? If you export that to a PDF file, you're going to have a thumbnail where the first page is the cover image. So already look at how different this is. You have so much more information to go on. The rest of these just look like wall of text posters, right? Um, you're not, you can't tell what they're about. But this one, that cover slide teaches you something about ACH release in the BLA, right? You're like, oh, I already learned from this poster. And really, you could take it even further. So you want to use everything your conference gives you, use it to teach. If they give you a thumbnail image, use that thumbnail image to teach people something. If they give you a file name, use the file name to teach. So we could even do like a three word SciComm challenge here. We could be like ACH earlier experts.pdf, right? Like that's that's the least better than, you know, ON.pdf, right? At least people learn something from it. Just always be teaching. And what that does is it establishes a good rate of return. So if you can teach somebody, if somebody learns something from your poster in the first five seconds of paying attention to it, it establishes your poster as like a good source of learning and then people will continue. So what we've done here already is we've eliminated the zooming and we've probably shrunk that choice paralysis a little bit where now they have a little bit more information to go on, which has gotten people closer to just being able to click and learn. And there's another big hurdle here, but we're gonna go over that after the game break. So I think this is where Sarah comes in, but I have a, a design game for all of you um, that we're gonna play, break things up, and then we'll talk about the biggest hurdle of all that we haven't even discussed yet to getting people to use virtual posters. So Sarah's gonna share a link with you. I just stuck mm -hmm. it in chat, everyone. Awesome, I see you guys that. popping up. Okay. I'll wait till everybody gets in here. We got 27 in here out of 78. 29, nice. <laughs> this is a good metric for how for which you're still paying attention to the engaged front of the class guys and girls. Let's see. And gender not binary. Sorry, I want to be inclusive here. 39. Okay. When that number hits 42, I'm going to start talking. Oh, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so, oh, you guys are rock stars. A large percentage of you are here. This is great. Okay, cool. So, this is a very silly game that I started playing with myself to teach myself visual hierarchy more. And then people ended up really, really liking it for understanding that I think you usually hear that design is about making things look pretty. But there is a science to it. And it's much more scientific than that. Uh, or it's much more functional than just making stuff look pretty. So what I want you each to do is what you're going to do, and don't do anything yet, but just look at my screen or look at uh, the first the first slide, is you'll see these numbers, like one, two, three, four. And what you're going to try to do is you're going to try to make people look at the screen in that order. You want them to look at here first on number one, then at number two spot, then at number three spot, the number four spot. So here's an example. Um, from Mortiz, your eyes go straight to his face, right? And then hi, Mortiz, big yellow bubble. And that was his one and his two. So you can see you're covering the numbers. And then follow this arrow was his number three. And then well done was his number four. So you're, he made your eyes go in exactly the right order, right? So that's what you're going to do. You're going to pick any slide and duplicate it. So just click on a slide, right click, and then duplicate slide to, to create your own. And I'm going to give you probably five or six minutes in a minute here to just cover up those numbers in a way that makes people look in that order. Some of these are easier than others, and some of them are really hard. Um, I will tell you right away that if you find one where it's like four corners, that is brutal. I still struggle with that one because they're equidistant. It's hard to make people look in the right way. So I'll wait till everybody makes their own little playground slide. And then after you've done this, what we're going to do is we're going to go through a, a few of them randomly and shout out what we see first and see who gets it right. My favorite part of this game is one of you is going to be some like hardcore artist and your slides going to be gorgeous and you're going to direct the eyes all perfectly and then we're going to discover that you should be teaching this webinar. But there's no like if you get the eyes to move in the right order, you've won. You don't have to make it pretty. And that's the point of UX design. All right, looks like a lot of you have duplicated slides. So I'm going to start a timer for five minutes and you can use anything. Use text, use images, 
grab stuff from Google Images, uh, Google Images or draw stuff, whatever you have to do, change the background color, it is your slide. So I'm gonna start the timer for five minutes and just cover the numbers with stuff to make people look there first. All right, start the timer for five minutes. You have five minutes, go. And I will be giving you advice as you are doing this. Hopefully it doesn't mess you up. But generally to start out with, the eye goes to where the most contrast is first. So you can think of contrast, anything that gives contrast, a very bright color on a dark background or the reverse. Some of you are, I see are using faces. That's very good. You have a special area of your brain, the fusiform face area, I think, uh, for processing faces. We attend to faces very quickly. After contrast or with contrast, your eye goes to where the most contrast is. And it also goes to what you can process the most easily. So you go to what's easy to process down towards what's hard to process. So a lot of things can make things easier to process. You can make them bigger. You can make them bolder. You can make it harder to process by having more words than less words. There can also be confounds. One time someone played this game and they accidentally pasted in a photograph of one of the other participants. So when she went, she saw herself first and like that was completely <laughs> impossible to predict. But usually these are pretty universal. Like you can make most people's eyes go in the right order. You have three minutes and 40 seconds left. You got plenty of time. Have fun. You can also use arrows kind of work. I wouldn't over rely on them. What an arrow does is if you think of the diagonal line involved in an arrow, um, it, uh, it moves your eye towards that direction. So a line that is moving the same way um, can also can sometimes accomplish the same thing. But arrows are good because you got the, the weight at the end of the arrow too. Um, I see a lot of posters where people are like, look here, look here. Um, it's better to do it if you can. Your arrows are still good. Please use arrows. But um, if you can use it, try, a try at least a couple of things with, um, with not using arrows. So I'm going to set you a maximum of one arrow, zero arrows if you're like, a, yeah, maximum one arrow. Don't rely on them. I don't mean to put pressure on whoever's on the strawberry slide. You guys got plenty of time, over half the time still left. Oh man, you guys are doing some good stuff. What you're learning right now, if I haven't said this already, is called visual hierarchy. So you're learning to help the user understand what's important and take them through a conversation. If you think of your poster as a conversation, you have something you say first, something you say second, right? Like I learned this, this is our methods, this is how we learned it, here are a few exceptions. That's how you'd say it out loud to a person. The goal is to say it through design where they read it in that order. And that's what you're learning how to do right now. You're learning how to direct people's eyes to the things you want them to see first and second and third. You have two minutes left. The multi-page thing I've been showing you is actually a way to sort of get around this, where you let people pace themselves by putting one point per slide, and then they can choose when they want more information. Um, so it kind of hacks it. But if you only had one page, you would really need this. And when we go back to physical posters, this exercise is really going to help, I hope. I still got over a minute left. You can kind of think of these as um, Eventually, when you go to design your next poster, you'll think of these as sections of your poster. So you can imagine these as points that you want people to look to first and second. There's also an implication here that if you have 10,000 points on your poster, imagine trying to walk people through 10,000 things in order. Like it's fatiguing. And that's how people read. People have to read one at a time. That's called the limited capacity model. Uh, you're using pictures, shapes. This is great. Uh, see some of you using faded colors. That's a good way to do it. If you generally like most of these backgrounds are white, so brighter colors are going to have less contrast. Pro tip if you put gray behind or like some closer color behind another color, it'll reduce its contrast. And if you think of things that are like, uh, in design that are like faded into the background, um, bold text, light text, that kind of thing. That's what's happening is you're giving it more or less contrast. A 
lot of these graphic design rules you hear about like alignment and contrast and color and those kind of things, they have roots in cognitive psychology in making uh, people, helping people process things very efficiently. Okay, that's here five minutes, but I'm gonna give you until this person on the strawberry slide with the strawberry cake covers number four. You know who you are. You determine the end game for the rest of everyone. Oh, it's gonna happen. Anonymous dolphin. Don't delete it, cover it. I hope you guys are covering your numbers and not deleting them. Thank you, strawberry person. Okay. I don't know what it was. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. Um, that's about time. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through some of these. Um, all right, let's do one. And hopefully I can unmute some of you. Brittany, did we figure out if we can unmute people? Uh, we can. Uh, we just need to know what their names are. OK, um, cool. Um, let's, we'll try this one, see how it works. So I'm going to pick. All right, everybody. I'll unpick, I think, probably back to my screen if you're not already on my screen. Um, so I'm going to pick one of these at random, and then we're going to see how it worked. And I'm going to pick a few, and then I'm going to ask whoever I picked to do the next one. So here we go. Are you ready? Here's the first one. I see a dog first, and that was, oh, you didn't, wait, was that number one? Nicely done. I'm going to change this background, but hey, you there is second. I'm going to guess that was your number two, and I bet you've got a number three back here. Let's change the background to white, see how it goes. Two, four. Oh, I missed number Ooh. three. What was number three? You got one, two, four. Uh, you probably didn't finish. Um, all right, pick another one at random here. Go vote right away. Lightning bolts. Nice. Okay. Number one, well done, because the lightning bolts serve as directional arrows. Your, your, eye, your eye goes down the diagonals. Number three is still exposed but let's try finding your polling place. Number two, I like this really like on point relevant example. Like you're really using design for good right now. Number three, I follow the arrow. Oh, there we go. Um, you almost got that and you, and you did it with real content, which is extra impressive. This, this is the kind of thing you can do with good design, right? Like if you can imagine someone having this question in their head, like go vote. Well, I don't know where to vote. Find your polling place. Well, where's my polling place? Oh, here's the link. It you followed that order really well, right? And that's what that's what you do when you design stuff like this. Um, okay, whose was this? Because let me try to raise their hand. Yeah. So maybe we can. Uh, if you put your name on your slide, then oh um, yeah, that's Sarah right. can go in the back end and unmute you. Jennifer Fowler, happy oh. face. It's fine. Jennifer Fowler, who should be smiling with her mouth open. Hello. 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 Um, okay. Cool. I got the numbers Where's mixed Jennifer? up. My bad. <laughs> okay. Good. You did a great job. That was awesome. Okay. So Jennifer, it is now your turn to pick the next one. So okay. I'm gonna you. I'm gonna pick one, and then you're just gonna yell out what you see first. All right. All Ready? Right. Go Here for we it. go. Okay. Go. So the first thing I saw was um, actually Einstein. No, the number is gone. I think. Uh, let's see if they. Um, keep in mind your order. Let's see. Where is the text color? Here it is. One, oh. nicely done. Okay, what's next? Second was rainbow. Four. Oh, oh, okay. Number four. Dang. Okay. okay. The third one I saw was the stem, and then the fourth was the arrow. So, so I kind of got it backwards. It's cool, Jennifer. What I or journey, uh, journey you baked to this one. I think probably what you're going for is the clockwise thing, which Maybe. Can, can really work, right? Um, yeah. Jennifer, don't blame yourself. Your eyes go where your eyes I go. I should have followed the arrow. <laughs> I was looking at the bright colors. <laughs> no, it's okay. But that's good, right? We've learned that those bright colors are super attractive, right? Like yeah. That, they, this is so like ruthless, right? Like for, for journey's sake, like yeah. if you, like you, you think you've got it even after like years of practice and somebody will just be like nope like the arrow you know your rainbow had this kind of curvature and it was pointing me this way and you're like mm -hmm. well now i learned right so these are journey you had a hard one because you did a lot of bright colors um and that's mm -hmm. hard to contrast but it was a hard mode okay thank you jennifer I'm gonna do, do, let's see if journey can do it next um well done on the voting thing again right, oh, unmute, look, journey i think i'm unmuted okay hey journey yep. hi right, you ready to do the next one 
Yeah, actually, 28, slide 28 caught my eye with a huge hello. <laughs> OK, all right. That's going to be number one. What's next? Um, then I went to the beautiful sign. Two, well done, whoever this is. Um, and then my eye went to the stop, interestingly. Oh, that was a hard one. That color is so contrasting because you have a lot of grays in here. And so that just comes right out. And stop signs are like coded in our brains to be meaningful. Um, mm -hmm. That was that was good, though. And then almost got it. Three out of four. And now I think, so what I, I don't know. I think we're probably running slow on time, but I want to try one thing because I want everybody else to get feedback on their thing. So thank you, Journey, also. Um, if you guys, what you can do now is pick the slide above yours. And if you look on the last slide, so slide 47, I don't know what happened to slide 47. It was organized when I started, but you see you have these numbers that you can copy and paste, like one, two, three, and four. Um, what I want you to do is just pick the slide above yours and copy paste these one, two, three, four numbers on top of what you look at so people get feedback. Does that make sense? Yes. Cool. Okay. I have never done this before. I hope this is helpful for you guys getting feedback. This game evolves. <laughs> this stupid silly number game evolves. <laughs> Continues. It will have more animal pictures. But I hope this is fundamentally what you're doing is an essential part of design skill. So as silly as it may feel, you're learning a lot, hopefully. Give you guys a minute to do that. And then check out your design, see how close you got. Some of these are really good. The people use photos, that was hard mode if you use more than one. Nice. Look at the complimentary colors, that's great. Also, sorry, I've been locked in quarantine with um, my partner and my foster dog for a long time. So sometimes I talk in a voice like I'm talking to my foster dog to like, normal people because we've been trapped in here together so long so that's how i talk to the dog look at the complementary colors pink and uh company color is interesting fact is usually your rods and cones in your eye like if you fatigue one of them the other one will still be active so blue and yellow are opposite sides so if you fatigue the blue the yellow show or the yellow or the, you can use the blue and the yellow like in contrast like blue and yellow cones that's why it's such a high eye catching thing because it's so stimulating it stimulates both um I butchered that explanation, but generally complementary colors are rooted in how your retina processes images for the highest contrast. Nice cat photo. We do a couple of these. Cat photo one, flash two over here. Four. Oh, you picked the corners one. You almost got it. Okay. Give you guys another 30 seconds on this. I hope you're I hope this is helpful for you. Like this is really the way to think about helping people process things one at a time is your goal here is really to sort of order that conversation of your design. Okay, cool. And 10 more seconds. Now we're good. Okay, cool. I will leave these up for a while if you want to check out your thing. Uh, if you haven't already like uh, checked out your own thing. So Everybody start winding down, start paying back attention to my beautiful game break slide. So we got one more hurdle to knock down. Then we can go questions. Okay, so I'm gonna start with our last hurdle. Remember we fixed the zooming at this point with our scrollable virtual poster. We've fixed the, we've lowered that choice paralysis, right? But there's still one big hurdle left in virtual posters and that's, deciding to go look at posters, right? Like you have this busy scientist who is sitting in quarantine at home. She's like searching Google Scholar for like literature. She's taking a break on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, right? And you have to convince this person to stop doing their work, stop like enjoying themselves on the on like YouTube and Twitter and go look at posters, which are traditionally miserable on her conference's website. I suspect a lot of scientists will never do this. And the ones that will, will just check in once to be a good citizen of their field. So really the biggest hurdle in virtual posters is deciding to go look at posters. How can we reduce that, right? How do we get this person to do that? What's well, easy actually, you just put posters where they're already looking. 
So they don't have to decide, it just comes to them. You bring the poster to them. So we wanna put a version of our virtual poster on Google Scholar, on YouTube, on Instagram, on Twitter. And I know some of you are like really averse to social media. If you are like really anti, if you are on any social media that you like, use that one. Um, but even if you're averse to it, at least do Google Scholar. Because if you get your poster on Google Scholar, then like two years from now, when somebody like you is researching that thing that you're also passionate about, then they can find your work and be helped by it and maybe even reach out to you and be like, thanks, or, you know, like collaborate or something, right? So at least put it on Google Scholar. Um, but really think of each of these platforms, you don't have to do them all, but think of each one you do as like an impact booster that gets your poster in front of more and more eyeballs. Um, and I'll show you how easy this is. So it seems kind of daunting to be like, oh, I got to like export my post for all these platforms, but it's stupid easy to do this. Like you can just with like a few minutes of extra effort on what you already have, you can get it on all these platforms. So you've already created at this point a PDF version for your conference, right? We'll just go to Figshare to get it on Google Scholar and you literally just click and you drag and drop into this box up here on Figshare. It's like four clicks and then you hit save changes and it publishes and you get a little uh, DOI URL and get some Google Scholar. So you can take the PDF you already have for your conference, drag it onto Figshare, poof, it's in Google Scholar in like under five minutes. These other platforms are easy too. Um, like Twitter and Instagram and YouTube are easier than you might think too if you work with what you already have. So for Twitter, we want a animated GIF, right? So we can have sort of our, so our pages scrolling through automatically like this. If you've seen Twitter poster before, this is the whole idea, right? And I wanna show you how easy this is to create. So we have our poster right here, right? All we do to create an animated GIF for Twitter, file, export, create animated GIF. Let me create the GIF and it goes to our folder. Then we have that, right? Then we have, sorry about that. Then we have our, our animated GIF, right? That was like less than a minute. But now we want Instagram, right? Well, Instagram, it wants a slideshow. So you can kind of flip through, which is actually more intuitive for the user than Twitter because you can choose when you're ready for the next slide. So we wanna create a slideshow for Instagram. That's also easy. All Instagram wants is our slides as images, right? They just want a separate image for each slide. This is where these like square dimension I created in the example poster, this is why it's square because Twitter and Instagram really love square shapes. They both accept square. You don't have to do anything else to it. So for Instagram, we just go file, export, and then change file type, PNG. I'll have all of this in a video in a month or so, less than a month, hopefully. Save as, and then we save that, right? And what we end up with is this. We have a Twitter version in a GIF, and we have our Instagram version where we have each slide as an image. And we just drag this on Instagram, and we drag this GIF version on Twitter, and now we've boosted our impact by probably tens of thousands of people, right? Like that, we can we can get our science out to more people, and we can start crowding out some of that like junk pseudoscience people read with real science, because now we got scientists summarizing their own work, which is the best case. Um, finally, we have the YouTube version. So I'll just show that slide. Um, so YouTube version tiny bit more involved, but like not a lot. So for to create a YouTube version of your poster, the cool thing here is that you can expand a little bit. Whereas this poster might be a minute, your YouTube version, take it to two or three minutes, right? Add a little extra detail. You, If there was a slide you hated cutting, add that back, right? Explain it a little more or don't, doesn't matter. Um, but all you have to do for YouTube is, first of all, you probably change this to widescreen, but you'd go slideshow, record slideshow. And then this opens this recorder window that may break Zoom. Hopefully you won't. I think you've probably done record slideshow before, but um, you couldn't see that because it opened a different screen. But basically you just hit record slideshow and that's gonna save you a video file that you can drag on YouTube. And dragging on YouTube, if you've never uploaded to YouTube before, I want you to see how easy this is. So if you go to YouTube. Um, but we might wanna slide. save a, questions? a little bit of time cool. for questions, Mike. <laughs> Cool. I'm done then. Sorry. Click this button to upload to YouTube and you're done. It's literally this create button. And that's the whole thing. So that's the basic idea. You can link these to each other as impact boosters. That's it. I've got questions. Sorry about that. I wanted to spend a little extra time on the game. Hope that was enjoyable. But that's the basic idea. Just create impact boosters. Make a scrolling for easiness. <sighs> nice. Thank you for having me. <laughs>
<laughs> sorry, we can go questions now. I'm sorry, guys. I ran, the game ran a little long, but I hope that was fun. No, no problem. Um, so thank you for thank you, Mike. And if you have questions, go ahead and put them um, into the Q and A. I will. Um, Sarah will field them. I did want to I'll let everybody know this is this is for some it may seem like a pretty radical approach to posters, but um, it it's up and coming and I strongly suggest that you just Google better poster template and you'll see ones that you can actually use right now um, yeah, for that are a little bit more traditional, but also that are useful for virtual like posters um, and everything thanks to Mike is open source. So yes. you can just copy and paste it down and then fill it in. So yep. This is, it, it is very different from the way you're used to designing posters. And I think there's a temptation to think that the way we've been designing posters is there must be some reason for it. It must be right, but it's not. It's that there's, there's evidence against it working. It's very ineffective. And if you do nothing else, you should just not do that and try something else. These designs, I can defend every pixel. I can cite your research for every decision I made in these. Um, so you're really following theory and evidence more when you try to take a risk with these new designs than you are with conforming with the old design. But I know it's scary. But best way to learn is experiment. All right, Mike, we have a question from anonymous yeah. attendee. How can we reduce the friction of changing how posters are created within our own circles? This is something I don't think my advisor would go for. It's a great question. Um, so if you send them the second better poster video, um, it in, it cites research. So I, I do a, a good job in that, I think, of citing studies and very mature theories for every decision. Um, and talking a little bit about the evidence that's against the traditional way of doing posters. Keep in mind also that you're, you can use conformity pressure too. So you can say that like major scientific conferences have adopted these kind of principles, um, including ACR, APA. Um, I think it's important to understand that your advisor feels conformity pressure too, just like a grad student. They're worried about what their colleagues will think about them if they break with tradition, right? But that idea of adhering to tradition is so anti-scientific, right? Um, I would say that there's more evidence behind the new ones, and that's true. Well, thank you. Uh, Amanda oh, asked um, if this recording will be shared. She has a few people who also might be interested in this video. And the answer is yes, uh, this recording will be posted on the New Mexico um, EPSCOR website uh, later this week. So to know that. Um, Awana Marzia Moshi, uh, hello, it says, it seems that the poster will be more slide presentation, as you said. Maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit. Exactly. It's a silent presentation. But if you think of, if you're very busy on the internet, right, um, that time you spend orienting to a one-page poster, like where is everything, that's waste, right? So to break the feel of scrolling through a slide deck, um, I like the square thing, but also if you keep it to one point per page, it feels more like a conversation. And scrolling is easier than zooming. Scrolling is an easier effort. So that is a risk that you're like feeling like a slide deck, but if you keep it to one point per page and really think of it like a, like a silent slide deck, it's a silent presentation. So everything you've learned for doing good presentations would, would help you with this. And if you're already good at presentations, you'll make probably very good posters in this style. Uh, Carol Allen asked, said, I like your approach, but sense resistance. How do you know when it's okay to use this? It may duplicate the initial question. And then also Andrew kind of, um, Andrew Cummings uh, follows up with that. Mike, I adopted your format early on, but I've been met with some indifference or even resistance. There's also the risk of sticking out in a bad way. The gatekeepers are mostly the old guard that are hesitant to change. How do you get the olds on board? <laughs> Thanks, um, Andrew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I think what we're finding in our poster studies is that some late, it's a myth that it's only that generation, like the old guard that that is like really resistant to it, right? Um, there are a lot of old guard that are really supportive of it. Um, and it, there's differences, right? And it, even we did one study with the CDC where they found that later career researchers liked it more. The big thing here is that most of the resistance, I'd say almost all of it, comes from my first design. So my first design was basically this one without a graph. It was a complete minimalist. It was a reset, right? It was like, put your main finding in the middle, stuff on the sides, right? People, like, it was like 70, 30, like 74, 30, I hate you, right? Um, which was, it was kind of meant to find that that middle, that, that bottom, right? Um, these new designs like this, the generation two layouts that are in the part two video, much less resistance. People are much, much uh, more accepting of them, especially I tried this one. This is called the presenter layout. 
Um, this is the least controversial design of the Better Poster family. Um, part of that is because people like to see graphs and figures, even if they don't read them. It's reassuring that there's that detail there. But also, if you make the graphs big, people can explore them. So I would really try this one. Don't pitch this one if you're going to get resistance, because that's the most controversial. Go with this one. I think you'll get a lot less resistance. So far, people have been much, much less resistant to this one and more accepting. But again, virtual, just make sure they don't have to Zoom. And part two is going to be your friend here. Um, we have, it looks like two more questions. Uh, what's the maximum number of slides that would be ideal for this approach? Is there a sweet spot? About a minute, Did, like, like literally read them out loud. Um, and if you go over a minute, cut. Um, because you want people to have that energy left over to see other posters. And if they're really interested in yours, like you can see in the example poster, they'll have links to more to the video version of the paper. Um, but yeah, I think about a minute. And I know that's controversial, but like it's, that's, that's the kind of level where you could see lots of posters and enjoy it, right? And if you're interested, you can pursue more. That's how the internet works. Well, let's go with this last question by Steven. Can this method be adopted for physical poster presentations? The physical poster templates, definitely, for sure. I mean, that's where you have these. Um, I think what you learn in the visual hierarchy will help you. The, the, the problem with physical is you have to fit it on the same page. So I think the exact same principles apply. Um, all the principles you learn still apply. The difference is you're going to have a little harder task with what we did with the game. You're going to have to make people, like if you look at this one, it's designed so they look at the left first because people read in an F pattern and they can process these kind of in order, right? Um, so you said same principles, very low interaction costs, easy to interact with. You're keeping that cognitive load low um, and you're keeping the information sent high by doing punchlines. So instead of thinking in titles like we normally do in science, think in terms of teaching. So you can see each of these graphs have a like a summary of the graph. This is completely supported with evidence too, by the way. Um, but the idea is that you're, you're if the people are trying to read the graph while you're talking to them, that's so much cognitive interference that you want to just spell out, like, here's what it shows. Here's what you're looking at, right? Um, so things like that that can help them think, if that helps. Awesome. Oh, this is so wonderful. OK, I'm going to take back over and close this out. Um, but I want to get us on the right thing. So if um, here's an example that we have. Uh, that's a little more traditional, but um, for New Mexico EPSCOR posters, um, but you don't have to use it, but it is a little less scary and it still follows some of the same concepts. Um, but I want to use this time to thank Mike. Oh, oops. Oh, well, to thank Mike and um, thank you all for joining us today. You can find him on Twitter and YouTube at Mike Morrison and keep an eye out for his releases. He, as he mentioned, he's working on one that's going yeah. to air soon. Yeah. Um, I will add and, that it, this is the beginning of something. We're at the beginning of changing all this. So there's still a lot to do. And if you have suggestions, please send them my way. Great. And then, um, I have stopped the screen sharing, but I wanted to also really quick thank my co-pilot, Sarah Pache, and all of the National Science Foundation uh, communication folks and folks, other folks who helped me get the word out about this webinar. Um, with that, I want to, want to thank Mike again for his time and thank everybody for being here. Thank you guys for coming very have much. Have a wonderful afternoon. Yay. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.